Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our fourth webinar of 2021, a part of our patient ambassador program. And um, we're celebrating National Kidney Month this month. So um, this webinar will be all about kidneys. Um, my name is Cece Cunningham. I'm the uh, program manager of the Chris Klug Foundation. Uh, I'll be introducing you to today's uh, moderator and panelists. And um, first, I would like to thank our presenting partner, the National Kidney Foundation, and our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rust Foundation. Uh, just a quick note, if you're new to Zoom webinar, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box to field questions to the panelists on your console. We are going to have a brief Q&A at the end, so we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A as they come to mind. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, first up is Dr. Robert A. Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is head of surgery at NYU Langone Health. He's the director of the NYU Langone Transplant Institute and a world-renowned kidney transplant surgeon. He is an innovator in the field of kidney transplant, having been a member of the team that developed the laparoscopic procedure for living kidney donation. Dr. Montgomery also developed and performed the first domino paired donation or paired exchange donation for living kidney donation. In addition, he is a transplant recipient himself. He received a heart transplant from a hepatitis C positive donor and actually uh, works to promote this practice throughout the world. Dr. Montgomery does have another engagement at the top of the hour. So um, you might see he's gonna be ducking out about five minutes before 2 p.m. Our, uh, Eastern time, uh, which will be during the uh, Q&A session. Um, our second guest speaker is Lisa Emmett. Uh, Lisa's husband, Neil, received a successful kidney transplant through the process of paired kidney exchange, which ended up saving eight lives across the United States. Because of her experience as Neil's caregiver and support through his transplant journey, Lisa has turned toward kidney and living donation advocacy to inspire others and share her story. She currently serves as the executive director of the National Kidney Donation Organization and has shared her story on dozens of media outlets, including Forbes Magazine and USA Today. She is also the author of a Time Magazine article highlighting paired kidney exchange. Our third guest speaker on the webinar is Daniel Percival. Daniel is the program coordinator for the National Kidney Foundation. Um, she joined NKF in 2017 after spending 10 years with Donor Alliance as a community relations coordinator. Danielle started her career in a laboratory setting as the Director of Development for Laboratories at Bonfice Blood Center in their HLA testing program. Danielle's current emphasis at NKF is the Big Ask, the Big Give, which are educational workshops that focus on transplant and living donation. Our fourth guest speaker is Joelle Atkinson. Joelle is a kidney and liver transplant recipient and transplant advocate. After being diagnosed with infantile polycystic kidney disease at birth, Joelle received her first kidney transplant when she was 18 months old. Joelle went through the transplant process again, this time at eight years old after contracting pneumonia and received her second kidney transplant and first liver transplant. Today, Joelle is an active organ donation advocate and volunteers her time with the Gift of Life donor program while working with pediatric transplant recipients through the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Joelle was also one of two recipients of the Chris Klug Foundation's annual Bounce Back Give Back Award last year for her advocacy efforts and contributions to the organ donation community. And last but certainly not least, the moderator for today's webinar, liver transplant recipient, Olympian, and founder of the Chris Klug Foundation, Chris Klug himself. Cece, great job. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm honored to be a part of this. Uh, thank you for letting the liver guy uh, participate in the NKF uh, kidney uh, panel discussion today. What a star-studded cast we have too. Thanks you guys for uh, all being a part of this. And um, as MC, my job is to keep this uh, entertaining. I'll keep the corny jokes to a minimum, but uh, to keep this conversation stimulating and uh, moving in the right direction. What I thought would be nice is we just start with uh, a little intro ourselves. Uh, I'll tell my story just for a couple of minutes and then uh, give uh, each of our panelists in their own words to share their story and their uh, connection to organ donation. Cece did such a nice job introducing everybody. So you got a pretty good idea, but 
if we left something else, something out, this is your chance to uh, share your version of the story. Uh, again, my name is Chris Klug. I am the chairman and founder of Chris Klug Foundation, uh, which really is a uh, an obligation to be a volunteer and give back. And I joke about that, but that really was my um, my inspiration for forming Chris Klug Foundation and for uh, giving back to the transplant community. When I was on a waiting list for six years, uh, awaiting a life-saving liver transplant, I uh, said to myself and my family and my friends, I said, if I get through this, I'm going to do uh, everything I can to give back and, and help others that are going through this. And we know that's about 110,000 people uh, today. And uh, we know that uh, about 12 people a day don't get that second chance at life. And that's really what Chris Klug Foundation, that's what this uh, ambassador panel tour today is all about is uh, really educating people about the importance uh, of organ donation, of course, about the importance of registration and helping inspire anyone going through the same thing I did uh, about 20 years ago. I've been a lifelong skateboarder, snowboarder, and uh, board sport enthusiast. Um, had the opportunity to represent our country in three Winter Olympic Games, and in 2002 became the first ever organ transplant. Uh, recipient Olympian and Olympic medalist. Uh, I really have always had a passion for uh, snowboarding and for winter sports. It's fun to pass that on to my kids now who are avid skiers and boarders. Um, but I recognized in 2002 at the 2002 Winter Olympic Games that I had a great opportunity to uh, champion this cause and, and something that I'm very passionate about and uh, continue to be and, and made the commitment the rest of my life, I'll do whatever I can to, to help, uh, as I said, other people going through the same thing. Uh, it's been an amazing journey. I think uh, this is a very special group of people, not only on the panel, but in the transplant community in general. It's uh, an incredible people, uh, incredible group of people that uh, give back and make this, as I call it, the miracle of transplantation possible. And as we all know, that's not possible without the selfless and uh, without the um, incredible gift of, of organ donors. As I always say, the, the real gold medalists of this whole process. So I wanna honor our, uh, our organ donors and, and the organ donor families that, that make this whole process possible. I'm here today because of it and, and very grateful for that and intend to make the most of, of every day. I always share the mantra that uh, enjoy the ride and, and don't take a single turn for granted. And I think those of us that have gone through the transplant process uh, really know that life is precious and we're very fortunate to still be here. So as I said, as a 20 year uh, liver transplant recipient, I'm uh, proud to help MC this conversation today and to, uh, to help facilitate it. So enough about me, I want to pass the microphone to uh, Dr. Montgomery. If uh, just in a, couple, in a couple minutes, if you would share your version of the story and uh, anything we might have left out. And thank you very much for joining us today. I know you've got a busy schedule and means a lot to all of us that you took some time out of your day to share your insights and your expertise in this field. Well, well thanks, Chris. And, and thank you, Cece, for that, that wonder, wonderful uh, introduction. So, you know, as, as Cece um, mentioned, I kind of wear two hats. Uh, I'm a transplant surgeon um, and have spent um, most of my life um, taking care of transplant patients. Um, and at about the same time um, that I began that journey, I began the journey um, as a patient um, when I discovered uh, after my brother's untimely uh, death, death at uh, age 35 um, that I had uh, inherited the same genetic disorder that he died from and indeed that my father died from. Um, at the time, we didn't realize that um, his cardiomyopathy was um, a genetic uh, disorder. And, um, and then I have another brother who at age 39, a few years after um, my brother Rich dropped dead, uh, needed a heart transplant. So our family has been profoundly affected and now the next generation is as well. Um, and so again, you know, my journey as a patient and my journey as a transplant surgeon really uh, overlapped, you know, throughout my life. I had, um, you know, many amazing experiences as a surgeon um, and as a patient. And, and also, you know, um, uh, it's 
there, there clearly were um, some very difficult times. Um, it's a challenge to, as Chris, I'm sure, could tell you, to stay on track um, in, uh, a, um, in a profession that demands a lot of you um, when you're, you're dealing with your own um, you know, um, frailty and, and your own um, uh, disease. And, um, and I had quite a few uh, near-death experiences, had seven cardiac arrests before I um, finally got my transplant. Um, but, um, you know, I'm extremely grateful for all of it. And um, all of it has, you know, uh, been important in, in really shaping who I am as a doctor um, and, a, and a human being. So, um, you know, I think like many people um, who, who have struggled with um, diseases, they'll tell you that, um, you know, they are who they are because of that, and not necessarily despite that. But, and, and certainly I'm very grateful for, um, you know, everything that um, my disease has taught me about what it's like to be a patient. Um, and it has allowed, I think, me to be a far more effective um, doctor and surgeon um, and caretaker of transplant patients. Um, and it's wonderful to, you know, walk into a patient's room after doing a kidney transplant and them saying, hey, doc, you know, I know you've been through this, you know, tell me, you know, what do I need to look out for, you know, what foods can I eat, you know, and, th and that sort of thing. So um, it's really a privilege um, to, uh, you know, be in the position that I'm in. So thank you all. Thanks again, Doc, for joining us. What a unique perspective you do have. And uh, what you said about uh, what an incredible experience that it's been, you know, as scary as it was for me, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. It shaped me into who I am and, uh, and reminded me of what's truly important in life. And uh, what a gift to your patients and everyone you work with to have that perspective of uh, not only being an expert in your field and contributing to so many innovations in kidney transplantation, but also being a patient and uh, as a heart transplant recipient. So congratulations on your transplant and thanks for all you do. Thanks, Chris. Lisa Emmett, Executive Director of uh, National Kidney Donation Organization, spouse of kidney transplant recipient. Lisa, will you uh, share your story uh, in your own words for just a couple minutes? I will, Chris. Thanks so much for having us um, to your foundation. And Cece, thank you for that great introduction. I'm honored to be representing National Kidney Donation Organization um, among this esteemed group of panelists. So thank you all. Um, my husband was diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease in 2001 due to an unrelated medical exam. They discovered cysts on his kidneys. We were in shock, but we found that there's really nothing you can do with this degree, with this disease until it progresses to the point where he requires dialysis or transplant. So we had 16 years of waiting for that to happen. Um, his brother had always volunteered to donate his kidney. We were very appreciative and grateful for that. Um, his brother went through the medical evaluation process and was deemed medically ineligible to donate. So Neil's wife, me, came through door number two. And um, I also was deemed medically ineligible to donate my kidney due to a benign quirk in my renal arteries, which does not impact my life. But at that point, it impacted my life and my husband's life in a big way because I was not able to donate. So we, um, we were shocked and devastated at that point. And looking back, um, those obstacles actually served as educational tools that I use now in, in educating people about our journey because um, it, it just goes to show an, a willing donor is not necessarily an approved donor. And um, family, when we had family that was deemed medically ineligible to donate, um, the next best thing to do is to go out and tell the public, but sometimes the recipient is hesitant to do that. And that was the case with my husband. Um, he was very hesitant to let people know that we, he was in this situation, that we were in this situation, but ultimately we all decided that that was the best thing to do. So I started 
raising awareness on his behalf, not asking anyone for a kidney, but telling his story. And some people who heard his story happened to be two teachers at our daughter's school. And they both proceeded with being tested at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And they were both actually approved, although neither of them were HLA compatible matches to my husband. So even though they were not matches for Neil, they registered through Johns Hopkins Hospital with the National Kidney Registry and ended up donating their kidneys to strangers and Neil ended up receiving one in return. Now, it is important to note that you really only need one donor to donate on your behalf, but these two women were determined to help and so they allowed them to do so. That's awesome, Lisa. Congrats to you. uh, your husband and thanks for sharing your story. Thank you, Chris. Danielle, do you want to uh, elaborate a little bit on the great introduction that uh, CC gave you? Again, Danielle's the program coordinator for NKF, for our friends, uh, our fellow Coloradans, New Mexicans, and Wyomingans. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. uh, Danielle. I wanted to digress for just a second because you and I met way back in the day after you had received your bronze medal, you did some promotional things for Donor Awareness Council. And actually, February 14th and Saturn Donation Day. So it's nice to see you. I nice think we both have too. a few more gray hairs. Since a couple. Last <laughs> yeah. It's those damn kids, Danielle. I'm telling you, they're killing me. Yes. We just added a puppy to the mix, too. So I'm sure I'm uh, only getting grayer. Welcome to COVID. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Chris. Thank you, Cece, for inviting the National Kidney Foundation to participate today in this webinar. Um, I have been in the transplant community for 21 years. Um, As Cece said, I did start on the laboratory side with the HLA testing, which is matching a deceased donor with those on the waiting list. But it soon became evident to me that my passion was educating the, the public about organ and tissue donation and for them to make an informed decision not just sign up because. So that took me to Donor Alliance where I worked for 10 years and I had the absolute privilege of working with the driver's license office employees in both Colorado and Wyoming, because as you know, that is 98% of those who designate themselves as organ and tissue donors do so at the driver's license offices and they get that cute little heart, which is now black of all things. It used to be red. on their licenses. And my my work with them was just to give them um, very simple education that if someone said, oh no, I'm too old, oh no, I'm too sick, that they could very quickly give a very simple answer, but again, letting the person decide for themselves. So fast forward all these years, um, living donation to me is what will get everyone off the transplant list. And I actually looked at data this morning and as of yesterday, there are 91,085 patients waiting for a kidney. We have two, we need to all share our spare to get the folks off the list. So that really, when I did come to the National Kidney Foundation four years ago, um, that was my emphasis, it still is today, thank goodness, Um, NKF has the first steps to transplant and finding a living donor platform called the Big Ask the Big Give. And I just wanted to echo what Lisa said about um, kidney patients who are reluctant to, number one, you know, divulge that they have the disease, but then when it comes to finding a living donor, they're very, I'll say skeptical. So that is what we have found in finding a living donor. It is for waitlisted patients, their families and friends, but it's not for the patient to make the ask. We teach the families and friends to share the patient's story. But again, as Lisa said, it's not, um, we need one of your kidneys, please. It's just to say, you know, this is my loved one's situation. Educate them about donation. And then again, let them spread the word if they will um, to be able to find a living donor. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Danielle. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today.
And uh, finally, I want to uh, reintroduce Joelle Atkinson, who is a two-time kidney transplant recipient and my uh, liver transplant recipient sister, and uh, also our 2020 uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award winner with Chris Klug Foundation. Joelle, nice to see you again. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you again. I feel like we just did um, our chat when I was in my um, in-laws kitchen last time. So it's so good to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I have a little bit of a different perspective, I think. Um, I am, I was, uh, oh, I'm really big on the screen, it threw me. Um, <laughs> I was um, diagnosed with infantile polycystic kidney disease before I was even born, when I was in uh, my mom's belly still. Um, and so I was born and my kidneys were taken out when I was nine months old. Um, I was put on dialysis and I had to get to 22 pounds before I could be big enough to receive my dad's kidney. Um, and then when I was 18 months old, I, I was very grateful to receive the transplant from him. Um, my mom always says it was like the toughest few hours of her whole life with my dad being under anesthesia and me being getting my transplant. So it was um, very hard for them at the time. Uh, but that first transplant kind of allowed me to, you know, live my life. I went to school, I enrolled in dance, and I was able to start growing a little bit. Um, and then when I was about six or seven, um, my liver, my disease also can progress to um, hepatic fibrosis. So um, I started to develop cysts on my liver as well. And my kidney started to go into chronic rejection due to pneumonia. So I received my second kidney and liver transplant at the age of nine. Um, I'm now 30, so it's been 20 so on years. I also had my transplant in 1999. I think you did as well, Chris. Um, so I had my second transplant over 20 years ago, and um, it's kind of allowed me to live my whole life. Um, I graduated from high school, college. I'm an occupational therapist. You can see behind me, um, I work with kids all day. I play all day, which is the best job ever. Um, I got married last year to my husband. He's amazing. Um, and I just try to live an active life. I try to give back wherever I can. I've volunteered um, through the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh to work with kids with liver and small bowel transplants. Um, I'm really active into fitness and I just really try to promote um, organ donation as much as I can. So that's kind of my story. Um, and I'm just so happy to be here. Thank you so much. We're happy to have you, Joelle. Congrats on your recent uh, marriage. And I had my transplant in 2020 and you in 99. So you are technically a year older than me. I just want to point that out but a lot better looking, let's face it. All right, are we ready uh, for a few questions? I'm gonna fire a few questions at everybody. Let me start with, uh, with Dr. Montgomery. I promise this snowboarder is gonna try to keep the uh, questions on track. And don't worry to our participants, if I uh, don't ask the right questions or there's something I left out, we're gonna have a little Q&A at the end. Uh, Dr. Montgomery has to uh, leave us at uh, five till the hour. So I'm going to probably um, give you a few more questions here uh, early on, but let's get started. Uh, given the unfortunate events of the last year, have you seen or are you aware of any connections to COVID-19 and an increased risk of kidney disease and or kidney failure? If so, can you elaborate on that? Sure. So yeah, um, you know, um, severe COVID disease, you know, of the, the kind that, that forces you to be hospitalized and in an ICU setting um, has about a 30% a risk of acute kidney injury. Now, a lot of the, the COVID patients who get that sick will recover um, from that kidney disease as they recover from um, COVID-19. But a certain number of them um, are likely to go on to chronic kidney disease and, and need a transplant at some point. We're also seeing this with um, lungs, hearts, and livers. Um, we just did our first um, uh, transplant, liver transplant, um, as well as lung transplant for um, uh, two uh, patients who were um, recovering from uh, COVID-19. What are we seeing happening with the numbers on the on the list, Doc? Have they increased during uh, during COVID in the in the past year? Well, you know the the, the numbers on the list. It, it's it's always um, it, it's always a difficult way to gauge um, need 
And what I mean by that is people who are on the list are the people who have been cleared to get a transplant. And that depends on a lot of different things, including um, you know, how aggressive the transplant centers are being about listing patients. Um, so, you know, there, there was a drop in the number, total number of patients waiting for transplants over the last couple of years. And, and people were really happy about that. But of course, me being a skeptic, you know, I asked the question of my colleagues, is it that we're becoming more conservative in who we list? So I'm not sure that that's always a great, you know, representation of what's going on, but I think we will certainly for um, lung transplantation over the next few years, see an increase in patients who need lung transplants because of uh, COVID-19. Good point, thanks doc. Some of the hospitals cease doing uh, solid organ transplants during COVID. Uh, how did you manage that at NYU? And I'd uh, love to hear, you know, some, some insight on that experience. Yeah, so, so that was, you know, of course, you know, we were um, at the epicenter and um, during the surge um, this time last year and um, things were changing every day. And what I would tell my team um, during, you know, our daily meetings was we have to decide moment to moment about the equipoise, which is a term that we use in medicine, which means sort of the balance of risks and benefits, the equipoise of continuing to transplant patients versus waiting until there's some relief, um, you know, for this surge because our hospital was filled, our ICUs were filled with um, COVID-19 patients. Um, and we had some patients, you know, trans fresh transplant patients who were getting sick we had surgeons and physicians who were getting COVID-19 all at the same time in, in early March. Um, and there we did reach a tipping point um, you know, in um, early April where we decided that it was just too risky for our patients to um, undergo new transplants because the mortality rate at that time for a transplant patient who was symptomatic with COVID-19 was 20% or higher. So it was hard to justify, um, you know, doing new transplants in that setting until we were able to do them safely. And we really were thinking on our feet every day and developing new pathways, ways, COVID free pathways through the hospital for our patients. And once we were confident that, you know, we had that level of safety, we started um, doing transplants again. Good for you. I'm going a little off script here, Doc, but one more question. How are your uh, patients that have received uh, the vaccination, how are they doing? And any, uh, any negative reactions uh, yeah. or, or, or common denominators that you're seeing? This is a great question, um, Chris, um, and a really important one for the audience. This is news that's just kind of breaking, you know, as we speak. Um, so, of course, um, you know, as a frontline healthcare worker, I was one of the first um, transplant patients to um, receive um, one of the mRNA vaccines um, because you'll remember that the original trials that were done did not include transplant patients, did not include immunosuppressed patients. So we really had no idea what was going to happen. Um, the good news is it appears to be safe. So we, we, um, there's information coming out from a registry that was started by Johns Hopkins um, that's tracking um, several thousand patients. And um, they don't see any increase um, in um, side effects from the vaccine itself. The bad news is that people um, who are on immunosuppression are not responding in the same way as um, the subjects in the original pivotal trials. And um, about half of them are not developing um, antibodies. And um, about 80% um, of them are not developing the antibodies at the time that you would expect them to after the transplant. So potentially half of the transplant patients um, who have received um, both doses of the vaccine are still susceptible to COVID-19. So it's really important 
that people continue to um, practice, um, you know, the, the precautions that they used um, throughout the year because, um, you know, we're not safe yet. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of us who are looking really hard at this. I just got off a Zoom call. One of the manufacturers of the vaccine is now starting a transplant um, a vaccine uh, trial to look at this more closely to make sure that, you know, there's not risk of rejection and that people are responding and what can we do to increase the, the level of response of our immune systems that are chronically suppressed to the vaccine. Good point, Doc. Thank you very much for sharing that. Thanks for the uh, insights too on our how that's affecting transplant recipients. I got my second Pfizer shot about a week ago, and I'll tell you, I'm still being damn careful, but uh, so far, so good. Danielle, I want to, uh, again, pass the mic to you. The National Kidney Foundation is in the middle of developing the first ever national registry specifically for patients at all stages of chronic kidney disease. This is a huge step in supporting the CKD population. Can you talk about this a little bit more? Absolutely, Chris. So this is a new initiative and it's for anyone living with kidney disease and that includes um, kidney transplant patients, those on dialysis. One has to be over 18 and it gives them an opportunity to enter their health data into this registry and also to share any stories that they may have based upon their journey. It provides individual education for those who do register, but also peer support because it allows them to communicate with other folks who are walking in their own shoes. Um, and then the other point that we were trying to make is it's an easy way to get involved in research and innovation and have access to clinical trials, which we know that there are 37 million people out there who have chronic kidney disease, which is one in seven. Unfortunately, diabetes and hypertension are responsible for two thirds of that number, which is 24 million people. So there are tons of folks out there and this is a way to you know, make them be known to us, to the researchers, to, you know, for more clinical trials perhaps to be developed based upon um, their renal journey, if you will. So we're very excited. I mean, we are, you know, I think it's gonna make a huge difference because it's just started. Let's talk next year. And by then we will have some data um, that we would gladly share with you um, to see how things are going. And as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately kidneys are the most needed organ for transplant, um, 91,000 people, that's huge. So please, for those of you who are inclined to consider living donation, please get evaluated because there are so many folks who need it. And actually one thing that I wanted to echo um, that Dr. Montgomery said, you know, 91,000 people versus 37 million, the wait list really does not reflect the number who really do need a transplant. So I'm hoping that, you know, as this moves forward, that um, we will be able not to do a better job of evaluation. I absolutely don't mean that, but just to, to you know, recognize, that, yeah, maybe your neighbor needs a kidney. So I'll stop. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you so much. And, and I think you, you answered this with, uh, alluding to hypertension and uh, diabetes, but I guess that's the answer, but why are kidneys the uh, most needed organ for transplantation? Well, for that very reason, Chris, there are so many people, you know, worldwide who are diabetics, um, who have hypertension, who really, you know, for lots of reasons are not, you know, following a proper diet, perhaps not taking their medication, and it attacks the kidneys. I mean, that's just, you know. Dr. Montgomery, if you can add to that, please do, because I am not a doctor. 
no, I, I think you're right on. I, I mean, I think that, you know, these the the diseases that, you know, are such a, a burden, you know, in modern life seem to um, disproportionately affect the kidneys um, versus um, other organs. They seem more susceptible, um, you know, to these kinds of diseases. And I would add to that also um, obesity. In my understanding, uh, Danielle and, and Dr. Montgomery is that we can't solve this waiting list disease uh, through transplantation alone. We really need to, as a society, take better care of ourselves and reduce the numbers that are actually on that waiting list. And you spoke to that earlier about the 37 million versus the 91,000, I think were the numbers. Mm -hmm. And somehow we gotta, we gotta uh, all collectively uh, as a society, live healthier, more active lifestyles, um, take our medication, take care of ourselves to reduce uh, the need for transplantation. Is that, uh, is that the case? I, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you want to elaborate I, on that? Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're victims of, you know, um, our progress to some extent, you know, technology, you know, um, this, what we're doing here today, you know, sitting in chairs all day long. Um, this is not how, you, you know, our bodies were designed to be um, used, right? I mean, it's a modern problem, you know, not getting enough exercise. It used to be that just to take care of your your activities, you know, of daily um, living that you got exercise and you were lifting and moving and walking and all those things. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we need to certainly encourage people to eat better, um, not have processed foods as much, go back to some of, you know, the old ways of getting more exercise and, and eating better. But it's gonna be, that, that's an uphill climb, but certainly prevention is always better than having to uh, do something as dramatic as a transplant, right? Doc, I thought that was an invite for uh, all of you to come join me in Aspen and do a lot more snowboarding together. Right on. <laughs> Anytime. Let's get you on a snowboard. <laughs> Doc, you obviously saw the heightened need for kidney transplants worldwide and developed the Domino Kidney Exchange or Paired Kidney Exchange as a solution to address this need. Can you explain exactly what Paired Kidney Exchange is and the effect it has on kidney transplants as a whole? Sure. So, you know, um, in the in the late um, 90s, you know, I got very involved in trying to um, help people, um, uh, you know, receive a transplant who had barriers, had immunologic barriers. Um, and that was usually in the form of um, antibodies that they had developed as a result of previous transplants, blood transfusions, or even pregnancies um, that make them harder to match. And those same antibodies will attack um, a new kidney that's not properly matched. And the more of those antibodies you have, the more difficult it is to match the organ. Um, and so originally we were doing um, a, a procedure to um, remove um, those antibodies from the blood, which was a big deal. Um, and along came a woman named Joyce Rausch in the, uh, I think 1999, who, um, was the first recorded altruistic donor. So a person who just came forward and said, you know, look, um, I want to uh, give a kidney. Um, I don't know anyone who needs it. I I'll give it to anybody um, who, uh, who is in need. And so she came to Johns Hopkins. We, um, uh, you know, gave her kidney to a child. Um, we decided that was the right thing to do. She did this in a very public way. The next day we had 50 people um, who wanted to do that. Um, who called, we transplanted all our kids. And so we were thinking about how else could we make best use of this new source of organs that no one expected. And this idea um, came to us that these people who were having these problems with um, incompatibility, um, that these altruistic donors could start a chain, a chain reaction of um, transplants. And um, the National Kidney um, Registry then took that idea and 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 really um, you know uh, developed all the infrastructure to support that. And now, guess what? A thousand transplants every year are done 
because of um, these uh, kidney swaps. So uh, amazing. Um, we had no idea it would, and you know, would end up having that much of it in an impact. Doc, when the first altruistic kidney donor stepped forward and said, I'd like to donate a kidney, were, were you and the team sort of scratching your head saying, really at first or? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. believe me. She saw more psychiatrists and, you know, um, ethicists and this was a big deal. And in fact, believe it or not, in order to start doing these swaps, um, you know, on a, uh, a, a, a larger basis, because we were just doing them, you know, at, um, at Hopkins at the time, we had to change the law. Um, and so there was a whole process that we had to go through um, because there was a, a, a portion of the original um, uh, act that actually Al Gore had been um, the, the leader of in the 80s that suggested that you couldn't receive um, anything um, for donation. And some in the Justice Department were interpreting a swap as quid pro quo or you know, getting something for something else. So we actually had to go through that whole process of changing the law in order for this really to um, develop. Um, but this, you know, uh, altruistic donation is just an amazing thing. And every year, um, about 200 people come forward and, and, and donate to somebody they don't know. Al Gore invented the internet and paired kidney exchange? This guy's amazing. Now if you can just solve the climate crisis. Lisa, Dr. Montgomery gave us a, a great segue to paired kidney exchange. And uh, as someone who has been so greatly impacted by uh, paired kidney exchange through your husband's kidney transplant, can you share your experience uh, going through that and, and what it was like? Well, Dr. Montgomery, thanks to you and all of the um, surgeons and researchers involved at Johns Hopkins, as well as the team at the National Kidney Registry. Um, my husband's story is one from kidney failure to transplant success. And I was, explain they explained to me early on in the, in the, my husband's process about the option of paired kidney exchange after his brother was ruled out and I was behind door number two um, they just, even though my husband and I are blood type compatible, they took one look at me and the size of my hus husband and they said, there's no way your tiny little kidney is going to be adequate for a man of his size. He's a really big guy. And so it just goes to show, even if you have the same blood type, it does not automatically mean it's a home run for a compatible kidney. So they mentioned that to me um, at the beginning and I was you know, informed that they operate with the National Kidney Registry and that we would have access, or my husband would have access to a nationwide pool um, of donors from over 100 transplant centers. And really they were able to select the best match kidney for him when the donor ultimately donated on his behalf. And he received a kidney from a stranger at UCLA and it was flown on a red eye to Johns Hopkins. That's great, I love it. and. And how did you first learn about it, Lisa? Paired kidney exchange? Yes. So we knew going into his um, evaluation that paired kidney exchange would be an option. And I just you know, thought, okay, donor A is in a, hosp a hospital room down the corridor and they take the kidney out and switch it around. I had no idea that um, because we selected Johns Hopkins and because they're affiliated with National Kidney Registry, I had no idea that we would have access to a nationwide pool of donors. And I really strongly believe that that is um, one of the ingredients to our success. That's great. Well, I'm happy for you and your husband. Congrats. Joelle, as a two-time kidney recipient, you've experienced kidney disease and the effects of kidney failure multiple times. Can you elaborate on the steps you take uh, daily to maintain uh, good kidney health uh, in your daily life? Sure. So um, I just also wanted to say that I'm learning so much today. This is super informative for me as well. Um, so every day, um, it's kind of, it's super interesting because I feel like um, COVID-19 is so present in everything that we're doing now. Um, so I feel like what I would normally say would be I live a very active life. Um, I try to, I have an active job. I drink a lot of water. Um, I, you know, I do 
a lot of, you know, I just try to stay active. I work out every day, um, whether it's running or lifting weights or spinning or swimming. I just, I try to lead a very active life. I try to, you know, eat really good foods, um, try not to eat too much junk food, not too much sodium, uh, but try and, but I think now it's like, especially different because, you know, I feel like COVID-19 is so, is so prevalent. So um, I also got my second vaccine a couple of weeks ago and I'm still home, still masking when I, everywhere I go. Um, and I've been home for basically the past year until I started working. So um, it's definitely different. I understand what Dr. Montgomery was saying about the sedentary life. So every day I try to get up and walk around a lot. Um, I try to get all of my steps in and just trying my best to stay healthy in the environment that we're in now, because it's very different than typical, typical life. So that's kind of what I'm doing now, as opposed to what I would normally be doing. It looks like you have a gym behind you and, and this is my gym behind me. But is that <laughs> your secret to all those medals at the transplant games? I think so. I mean, I, this is my, um, I work, I work with kids. And so my biggest thing is also making sure that kids stay active as well, because our kids, especially right now with virtual learning, our kids are on the screen so much. So um, definitely like making sure that the kids stay active too. And that helps me stay active. You know, I'm jumping on the trampoline and I'm crawling with them under. So I think having an active job also really puts things, really helps me to stay healthy overall because I'm always moving. You know, as long as I'm working, I'm moving. So that's what I hope. And yeah, that's what I do now. <laughs> It's a way of life. Motion yeah. is lotion for me. And I'm now a, a 48 uh, year old athlete. And as long as I keep moving, it uh, seems to everything seems to keep working. Yeah, exactly right. That's what I do. That's my secret. Danielle, I want to go back to you. What is the question you get most often in your line of work? Chris, the most um, question that's you know asked is, how do I know if I'm at risk for kidney disease? So the NKF developed a very short quiz um, that I email to the folks. And it's basically, it asks how old you are, your gender, your race, if you smoke, your overall health, if you have diabetes or hypertension. And so based on your score, and I can absolutely, I just, I printed off a black and white copy, but I'm absolutely willing um, to share the document with you guys, you look on the back and based upon your score, there is a risk level and next to that, things that you should do. And then at the bottom, um, it lists two tests that we add, you know, test to ask for your next appointment when you go see your doctor. So the first one is a urine test. It's called ACR and that's albumin to creatinine ratio. Again, it's a P-test, and what it will demonstrate is if you have protein that's spilling over into your urine, but that's only a screening. So if it's normal, we say you're usually good to go, but if it's in the abnormal or highly abnormal, then the phys physician should do a diagnostic test, which is a blood test, and that's the GFR, and that will measure the filtration rate or function, kidney function, um, and then based on that, then the patient can get an accurate diagnosis. Thank you, Danielle, for sharing that. Dr. Montgomery, I know we're going to lose you here in just a minute. And uh, so I want to come back to you. And Lisa, you're not off the hook. I've got a, uh, another question for you, too, before we open it up to uh, our participants for any other Q&A. But uh, Dr. Montgomery, I want to give you a chance uh, for any closing remarks but before I do, I've got a very important question for you. We have come every fall since my kids have been alive uh, to run the New York City Marathon. And oftentimes we come and visit NYU and, and see you and your team and uh, get a chance to visit patients uh, in person. Obviously that hasn't happened in the last year, but are we gonna be back for the New York City Marathon this fall? Is that going to happen? Are things gonna look a little more normal this fall? And uh, what's, your, what's your prediction? Yeah, so, so you know, I think that um, we're seeing a real um, acceleration in the, the number of um, folks who are, are getting the vaccine. The vaccine works um, for most people. And um, so, you know, I do think we're pretty rapidly going to hit that sort of magic point where the, um, the, the virus basically just gets closed out, you know, of... Um, uh, you know, our, our um, 
uh, daily lives and, and it doesn't have, uh, you know, a, a mechanism for continuing to propagate um, through the population. So I think that's probably going to happen sometime this summer um, if things continue as they are. And if some of these variants um, don't, um, you know, uh, come through and as sort of an escape virus that, you know, um, is is not covered by the vaccine but that's being watched very closely so um so far so good on that that'd be okay with all of us and uh, i've said this this being our fourth ambassador panel tour already in 2021 i've said this many times but i miss my friends and uh, yeah. look forward to uh, socially gathering again soon so hopefully that'll be the case and we'll get to see you uh this fall coming back, uh, I hope, for the New York City Marathon. Yeah. We'll Last year was the 50th anniversary. It didn't happen. So we're hoping uh, the postponed 50th anniversary version happens. I think Anything else you want to share, Doc? In, uh, yeah, in so I, I'm just, I've just been looking through the Q&As and two things just to hit really quickly. A lot of people are concerned about what I said about the vaccine um, in transplant patients. And there is a way to check your antibodies. And people are asking, should I get another vaccine? Um, I'm sort of... Uh, you know, have been a, a little bit of, um, uh, you know, the guinea pig. Um, so I didn't have a response to the vaccine and I just got revaccinated with the J&J. &J. There are no, this is all, you know, there, there's no recommendations at this point. Um, and I will see in two weeks whether, you know, I, I responded to, to that. Um, but we're really learning on the fly. But the important thing is to just, you know, continue to be careful until we know the answer. The other question was what, about um, pair donation and what do, we, what do I need to do in order to get into that? I mean, basically, all you need is a donor who can, who, for whom it's safe to donate. And um, no matter what their blood type, what their compatibility, the size of the organ, whatever, um, that doesn't matter. Um, you just need to bring a, a, a living donor to the table and you can get into the paired exchange. So um, that's, I think, an important thing to sort of uh, leave with. Um, and thank you so much for this, uh, this opportunity um, and um, continue to do the great work. Everybody, all my, my panelists, um, co-panelists, you know, continue to do the great work and, and spread the word. Thank you. Doc, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for all you do for the transplant community, all of our uh, transplant friends. Continued good health to you. Keep us posted on the latest on vaccination and uh, keeping us all, uh, all of us transplant recipients and transplant candidates healthy. Will do. Thanks, Doc. Lisa, I'm coming back to you for one last question, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A, and uh, Cece will help me take some of the panelists' questions. Uh, is there, Lisa, for you, is there one thing you could say to someone who's thinking about becoming uh, a living kidney donor? What would it be? Um, I'll keep it short because I know we're short on time. I would stress that the potential donor do a lot of research in terms of transplant centers and donor centers that um, perform nephrectomies for donations because there are different, cent different options offered at different centers in terms of the timing of the donation and different protections are offered to living donors at certain centers and you just want to make sure that you're making an informed decision. Um, before you undergo this operation. It is major surgery. Um, however, the donor team will not approve a donor unless it is medically safe for them to proceed. Of course, they did not approve me um, for a, a minor issue in my renal arteries, but they felt it was for my long-term overall best health. So the donor's health overall is their goal. Their goal is not to approve someone to donate a kidney. Good advice. That makes sense. Cece, do we have some uh, questions from uh, any of our participants or, or maybe a question you or Lauren? I do want to uh, recognize Lauren Pierce, our executive director, uh, who is uh, very pregnant and uh, going to give birth any day now. So I want to say thanks to Lauren for all of her help organizing this panel discussion and, and all of our panel tour this year. Uh, so, Cece, thank you for helping with uh, hosting duties today. Uh, are there any questions from our panelists or any questions that you might have uh, as we progress here? 
Um, yeah, so uh, Deb at 1143 asked, um, she's interested in the NKF registry that was uh, mentioned earlier and uh, wants to know what she can do or what she needs to do to get involved in that. Cece, so what I did was in the chat box, I actually put the URL. So Deb, if anyone who's interested, if they will just go to that, then that will walk them through the process. Great, thanks, Danielle. Cece, uh, are we okay on timing for, do we have a few more uh, chat questions or shall I turn it over to uh, the, our panelists for some of their closing remarks? Um, I think, yeah, um, we have a lot of questions about the COVID-19 um, vaccine and the impact that that has on um, transplant patients, specifically kidney recipients. Um, and I wanted to um, just say, because we don't have Dr. Montgomery with us right now. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about the COVID-19 Transplant Community Coalition that CKF is a part of, and I will be um, showing that link in the chat as well. Um, so if you guys are interested in learning more, we have a ton of webinars that we co-host with them, um, and we will get that all set up and, and have you link over to that um, to learn more about uh, COVID-related questions. So I think in terms of, I'm just going through very quick, quickly um i think i think um it, it um actually lisa if you wanted to um explain the paired exchange process i think dr montgomery did that um you know did a good job of that but um if if you could explain you know your perspective briefly um you know did you face any barriers or issues i mean neil did he face any barriers or issues or problems with um with going through that process with going through the paired exchange process? That's right. No, our, our, that's why I'm so vocal about our experience because I really feel that our experience was seamless. You know, you go into, you go into, as a patient, you go into a transplant center, really not knowing what to expect, except they're gonna put you under a microscope and give you every imaginable test possible to determine if you're healthy enough to undergo transplant surgery. And then, you know, we, we give our faith and our trust to the medical professionals. And when they came to us and said, we offer this great paired exchange program with the National Kidney Registry, and you'll more than likely get, you know, the best matched kidney that you can because we'll have access to all of these 100 transplant centers across the country. You know, we did our own research, but we also put our faith and trust into the institution that we had selected and it really just ended up working out great in all ways and that's one of the reasons i'm so vocal about our story i like to dispel the myth that you have to be a match to save your intended recipient because you actually do not thank you for sharing that lisa that's awesome congrats to you and neil i'm so happy for you thanks chris cc any other questions you want to uh, pose Oops. Um, I think that's, um, I'm just going through. We got some uh, more, more ones. Oh, um, so from Doug, um, uh, he wanted to know uh, very briefly what's coming up in the CKF webinar series for the, um, the rest of the year. Um, and I guess I could answer that because <laughs> I'm you that one. Yeah, as I'm sitting here. Um, yeah, yeah. So we actually um, basically we try to get these webinars going once a month. Um, so this is uh, our March webinar. Obviously, next uh, month is Donate Life Month. Yay! We are. It's also the um, the submission window for our CKF's Bounce Back Give Back Awards, which um, we do every year. Um, it basically it honors two organ transplant recipients who demonstrate an extraordinary way of life post-transplant. So, you know, giving back to the community and also bouncing back uh, from transplant. Um, so we, we uh, award those, those two transplant recipients each year. And actually our next webinar coming up in April, April 13th, will focus on you know, the, our past uh, bounce back award winners and, um, you know, their stories and sort of explain more personal experiences of what those, um, those awards entail. Um, so I guess um, I'm trying to quickly, briefly go through these. Um, 
but I think that's pretty much um, uh, it for for today. That'll be a, uh, a great discussion in April, as you said, to celebrate Donate Life Month together and to hear from some of our past uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award winners, including uh, Joelle. Uh, and Joelle, we are going to bring you to Aspen for, uh, for the Summit for Life. Uh, we couldn't last year with COVID. It was a virtual event uh, and still a great success, but looking forward to seeing you in person. Thanks, Cece. Uh, I'd like to um, pass it back to Danielle and then uh, to Lisa and Joelle. Danielle, any closing remarks uh, that you want to share? Anything that we left out or uh, anything else that's important to you? No, I just want to thank you for having this platform where we can discuss things like we did today. Um, I'm sure it was very helpful. Even I learned a couple of things. Um, Me too. The participants. So please, please, please keep on keeping on because y'all are changing lives. That's what we're trying to do. You too, Danielle. Same to you. Thanks for all the great work you do and keep it up. I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person again too. Lisa, anything else you want to share as we wrap up here today? Well, again, I echo uh, Danielle's sentiments about um, the gratitude that all of the panelists have, as I'm sure I do, for your platform and your willingness to shine a light on living donation and organ donation in general. I think it's phenomenal and wonderful. And as Danielle said, and Dr. Montgomery hinted at, um, the organ transplant wait list, while large, is also not reflective of all of the people who might possibly be out there waiting for an organ, particularly kidney. And you know, as my husband was hesitant to share his story, I always say to people that you might not know someone in kidney failure, but you probably know someone's someone. It's, it's closer than you might expect. They're just not talking about it. That's so true, Lisa, thank you. Joelle, your turn. Um, I, I, again, thank you so much for having me. I've learned so much today. Um, it's been really, really awesome to, to learn so much. Um, and again, like we had talked about, um, the, the active. So if you're waiting for a transplant or if you, if, um, you're a recipient, we live very sedentary lifestyles right now. So definitely staying active and staying moving as much as possible. Um, to try and stay healthy because that's kind of my, my big goal in life is to stay healthy and to keep paying it forward. So thank you again so much for having me. You bet, Joelle. Nice to see all of you guys, uh, at least on Zoom for now. I look forward to gathering in person, hopefully in the next year. Thank you for being a part of this. Thanks for uh, everything that, that all of you do. Um, th this is such a privilege and an honor to be a part of this. And thanks for putting up with my uh, narration and uh, MC duties. But it really is a privilege and, and a, uh, a labor of love to be involved in this foundation, to be involved in this cause. And, and listen, we're uh, a small part of it, but uh, I think tr trying to have fun and, and do what we love to do and share this important message. So thank you all for agreeing to be a part of it today. Cece, thanks for uh, organizing this. Thanks to Lauren. I want to say thanks to our partners at NKF for uh, being a part of it, as well as Hearts for Us uh, and supporting us. And, and thanks for everybody pivoting and, and keeping an open mind uh, with what's happening still in the world. We're starting to see light at the end of the tunnel, but thanks for joining us in, uh, in this Zoom format. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And again, thank you to everyone who joined us today. You know, we hosted this webinar today to highlight the vital role that kidneys play in the human body um, and to shed more light on the ways in which kidney transplant um, has improved over the years. So if you have any questions that weren't addressed or answered in today's webinar, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, our email is info at chrisklugfoundation.org. That's Chris K L U G foundation.org. Um, we've included that email in the chat um, as well as several other links um, that you can uh, check out for your reference. So we have, um, you know, the COVID-19 transplant coalition resource um, that, that uh, I discussed a little 
little bit, the NKF patient um, registry, uh, tons of um, uh, Lisa's organization, the National Kidney Donation Organization, all of those are linked in the chat. So if you guys have any more questions, please um, don't hesitate to reach out and uh, check out those, uh, those links if uh, you're interested. So um, yeah, so if you'd like to learn more about becoming a living kidney donor, you can check out the National Kidney Foundation or the National Kidney Donation Organization's website uh, for more info. Um, also, uh, like I said, April is Donate Life Month, yay! So um, to showcase the special month, CKF is encouraging everyone to get involved by hosting an event or webinar with us. Um, also, if you have a story about your transplant experience, you know, whether you're a recipient, living donor, donor, family member, et cetera, we invite you to share your story to have it featured on our website and social media. That's part of our programming that we um, try to inspire and encourage people to share their story uh, with others going through similar experiences. So um, please, like I said, email us at info at chrisklugfoundation.org to get involved um, and or share your story. Um, and thank you again to all of today's attendees. We hope you have a great rest of your day and stay happy and healthy.